welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 48th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. As many of you know, I have recently relocated to Bend, Oregon, and as such, many of the readers and listeners have been emailing me or commenting asking for today's episode, and I finally pulled it all together. It is a long one, so we're going to break this one into three different parts, all in today's episode, but we're going to have two intermissions instead of just one. Now, everything I talk about on today's episode can be found on the blog's show notes, the simplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 48. You can print off this checklist and have it handy, and uh, hopefully it'll help you have a seamless and stress-free move. So today's episode is all about the moving checklist, how to minimize the stress of a major life transition. Now, at the end of today's episode, I have a sweet treat for you. I was in the kitchen this weekend, actually two weekends ago. I did this twice. I did this last weekend and I did this two weekends ago. And it is a dessert that is so simple, that, but that is something that your guests and you will fall in love with. So make sure to stay tuned. But back to today's focus of our episode, Moving. I want to start off with a quote from Suzanne Colasatani. She states, And I think that if you believe in something and you want it so much, you have to go for it, which sometimes means taking a risk, even if it's scary. But the thing you want most to happen doesn't stand a chance unless you give it one. And I share that quote because making a huge move from one town to another, from one state to another, from one country to another can be, it can shake you at your core. You can be doubtful in the beginning. You can be doubtful in the middle. In the middle. You can be doubtful at the end. But with this proper preparation, I think what you'll find is it can and is worth the risk. It is. So let's get into this. The homes we inhabit are in many ways an extension of ourselves. They not only become the hug that greets us each evening when the workday is done or when we return from being out with so many uncontrollable variables, but they provide a sense of security, a source of inspiration, and offer a place for our routines to continue, restful sleep to be had, and meals and conversation to fuel and energize us. Being that our homes are such an anchor in our lives, When we choose or must move from them, relocating to an entirely different town, state, or country is an endeavor that can be quite daunting and full of a mixed bag of emotions. As I just mentioned, I recently relocated to Bend after nine years of living in the same house. Beginning on July 13th, I saw those moving trucks pull up, and up until now, the entire process I can truly say, was one of the most unexpected, effortless life transitions that I have ever experienced. And therefore, today, I would like to share with you how it happened so that you too, whether you are simply moving from one side of town to the other or moving to an entirely different zip code, can begin your new life on the best footing possible. Rested, cognizant of what you want, knowing how to go about it, and giddy about your new prospects. I'm going to break up the process into three separate stages, before, during, and settling in. Let's get started. So the before stage. Depending upon how much time you have prior to when you learn that you're going to move, and then you actually have to leave, you will tend to each of the items I talk about at your ability and your necessity. I had about two and a half months at my disposal to prep myself for the move. While at times this may have felt like a long emotional goodbye, I felt in the end it was an ideal amount of time to set down a path that would lead to a successful transition. 
So I have 15 items that we're going to look at for the before stage. Number one, you know you're going to move. You've just found out. So number one is inform those closest in person of this big announcement. Depending upon what the impetus for your move is, keep others' feelings in mind that will be affected upon the learning of your leaving. If your news is likely to spread quickly at work or through the social network, be sure to break the news first to those that are closest to you in person. For example, your close friends, your immediate family, and in my case, my students that I actually taught every single day. I wanted these people to hear it from me, my reasonings briefly, and so that whatever they heard outside of that, they would know firsthand what the truth was if things got skewed through the telephone line, as we know it sometimes does. Then go ahead and share with the town criers of the organizations that you work with or that you know in town, because you know, more than likely, the news will spread faster than you can blink. By tending to this vital piece that may seem small, but actually really lays a successful foundation. Those you took the time to talk to one-on-one will more likely than not appreciate the gesture and help make for an easier goodbye as they will offer understanding and support along the way. Number one is share in person with those that you are closest with. Number two is express gratitude. For acquaintances and colleagues who made a positive impression on you that you won't soon forget, and you want to make sure they realize how grateful you are for their optimism or support or leadership or guidance, whatever it is, take the time to write a thank you note. Mail it or deliver it. Sometimes you're not able to see these people in person anymore, or you're not able to coordinate schedules, but taking time to write that note will ensure that you get that message to them. You may never know how they received it, but at least you will have expressed your gratitude for someone you may never see again, but caused you to be forever changed because of their presence. So number two is express gratitude. Number three, plan gatherings, going away gatherings ahead of time. If you would like to have a last evening with friends and family, depending upon your personality and your schedule, plan such gatherings or dinner parties ahead of time. For me personally, saying goodbye to my house that I had spent such time and investment and emotion, I knew that would be really difficult for me to say goodbye. So I really wanted to spend those last few days and nights by myself in that house. And to some people that may seem odd, but for me... That's what I chose and that it was the right decision. I I never questioned that in the least. But for others, you may want to have a last going away gathering at your house, whatever it is, so you can make what you want happen. The reason for doing that is that you want to make sure that you exit in a way that leaves you with memories that are positive and memorable. So number three, plan gatherings ahead of time. Number four, leave on a positive note. Whether at work or in the groups you spend time with, perhaps each day wasn't ideal. I mean, no place ever really is. There's no perfection everywhere. But hopefully there was more wonderful moments than not. No matter the case, leave on a positive note. Be genuine with your goodbyes, but always make sure that the last memory of you is one that is positive. Professionally, you never know when you're going to be working with or running into fellow colleagues or, or bosses. And what the conditions are going to be. So always end on a positive note. If you do have grievances, leave them in your journal, but don't leave them out in public. That may just be a regret that you'll have if you do. So number four, leave on a positive note. Number five through 11 is dealing with the utilities and mail. Number five, the mail, the USPS or United States Post Office requires 10 working days notice to promptly redirect your mail to your new address. So be sure to stop by your local branch and fill out their simple form. I, I went about eight, I believe it was eight days prior to my move. And I probably I knew I should have gone a lot sooner. And she specifically said, and I heard her say this to a couple of different people, we require a week and a half, approximately 10 days for everything to be to basically not miss a beat. Now, I've already started receiving my new mail, so even though I, I was a few days late, it was fine. But that's something just to be aware of, to alert the post office of your new address. Number five, redirect your mail. Number six, tend to your subscriptions to magazines and newspapers. 
Really, this is pretty simple. I wasn't sure how easy this would be because I haven't done this in so many years. But it was actually pretty painless, and I did this in about 15 minutes one evening. With the ease of the internet, um, you can quickly go online and change your mailing address to all your different magazine subscriptions. Often the latest issue, and it will say this on your account, if you haven't received it yet, may have already been addressed and is queued for shipment to your old address. So that one will probably take some time to get to you if you're not there when it's delivered at your old address. However, if you change your mailing address early enough, so you can do this a lot earlier than you might expect, you can often designate the date that you want the mailing to be changed. I love this. I did this with my Wall Street Journal and my New York Times subscriptions. I was able to go in and tell them specifically on the date that I wanted the new address to be the destination. I didn't miss a lick. I got here on Tuesday, the 14th of July, and my Wall Street Journal was in the driveway waiting for me. So number six, change the address for your subscriptions to magazines and newspapers. Number seven is change the addresses for your financial, insurance, loans, credit, and bank accounts. While many of these items are tended to online for most of us, each of these accounts must be updated. So just make sure you give them a call or you can sometimes go online and just simply update it. You want to make sure those records are coming to you. You want to make sure that you're not making any of those payments late, number one. And number two, just having those records available to you, those paper documents available to you. So number seven, update financial insurance, loans, credit, bank account information, as well as everything else we're going to talk about. Number eight and number nine are two that were vitally important and sometimes forgotten until it's too late. Number eight is to update the address on your driver's license. You can quickly call or go online to your state's DMV website or business office and update your mailing address. Then they'll simply print out a new label that they will ship to you. I got mine in less than a week and you just stick it onto your original driver's license and you're good to go. You are good to go. Number nine is to update your voter's registration card. This is a biggie. If you want to have a voice in your community, you want to make sure you're able to vote on the issues in your town, but you have to make sure you let them know where you actually are living. Go to your new state's Secretary of State page or simply type in on the internet your state name, the one you live in now, and type in voter registration. And more often than not, the link will be right there and you'll be able to click right on it. As long as you have a driver's license number or your social security number, you're gonna be able to easily and quickly change your county and residence and it'll update your voter registration. They will then send you a new voter registration card. That usually takes some time, but just because you don't have it doesn't mean it's not updated. It usually is updated almost immediately. So just make sure you update your voter registration card. Number 10, with regards to your current or old utilities, not your new utilities. These are the ones on your old residence. If you are leaving a rental or your house is in, is sold and you don't have to tend to any of the utilities and keep the water going, you want to shut down all of your utilities. If you haven't sold your house yet and you need to keep it running, basically, you want to make sure your yard is being watered. So don't shut down the water. You want to make sure it's staying heated or cooled down. So keep your electricity, your gas going. So water, heat and electricity need to remain on. Otherwise, you're pretty much shutting down everything unless you're moving it like your cable or your phone. And I'll talk to you about those in a second. For any of the utilities, whether you're shutting them down or not, you're going to want to make sure to give them your new address. Why do you need to give the old utilities you're not going to use your new address? They've got to have some place to mail your final bill. You want to make sure you shut the door and do it properly without anything left hanging over your head. So make sure to call up your utilities and not only cancel them, but give them your new address. Here is a list of utilities to tend to. Cable. You may even have to drop off or mail the receiver, so ask with them about that. If you're transferring it, you're probably just going to pack up the receiver and take it with you. Internet. Water. Garbage. Heat. Weather, gas, or electric, or both. Electricity. And if you have a landline, you're obviously going to want to change that as well. If you have cell phone, you want to make sure that you simply give them your new address so the bill is relocated or redirected to your new home. So number 10, changing or canceling your current or old utilities. Number 11, set up your new utilities. Don't wait to do this when you arrive at your new place. You're gonna kick yourself. Do it well in advance. 
Once you have found your rental or purchased your home, you're going to want to start setting up your utilities rather quickly. I did mine in about three weeks in advance, but you can definitely do them sooner. Why? Some utilities are simple and can be turned on at the last minute, like water or electricity, but others will need to have a scheduled technician stop by your home. So in other words, if you want to have television and Wi-Fi when you arrive, you will need to schedule this well in advance. Also, be prepared to potentially prepay the first month's bill on certain utilities right off the bat. Here are a list of utilities you might need to set up. Cable and internet. This one you're going to want to make sure you set up three to four weeks in advance. I actually was fortunate. I was able to get the guy here on the day that I was moving in the 15th. I couldn't believe it. I had Wi-Fi and cable within an hour of him being here and it felt like I could do my blogging. I could relax in the evening. Boom. All at once. Water. It's a simple turn on, but just make sure you call him. Garbage. The thing with garbage, and I this is one little oops that I did. You want to make sure that you have them deliver the bins, the garbage cans, a week before you are going to be there so that you can have them filled up and ready to go on the day of pickup. So, for example, I actually arrived on the day of my pickup. I should have had them delivered on that day rather than the next week when I had them all filled up and ready to go for sure because I had just moved. So call and have them deliver the bins earlier than you get there so that you won't miss a, a pickup date. Next thing. Oh, one last thing about the garbage. Ask them for what the rules and regulations are when it comes to fees. What can and cannot go into the bins? Can you overfill the bins? Meaning can the top lid be set ajar so it's because it's so full? Can you set things beside the can and what, what's the charge for that? Just ask them for all those expectations and obviously the pickup dates and times. Next utility you're going to want to set up is your heat, whether it be gas and or electric. And then again, cell phone, make sure you redirect your cell phone bill to go to your new address. If you do make any changes to your cell phone account, just be aware of any potential grandfather clauses. This happened to me that I made a change and they did not let me know that it was a grandfather clause. And then I was like, whoops, it's on me, it's totally on me. So I just asked that ahead of time before you make any changes on your cell phone bill. Are any of these unlimited offers grandfathered in? So if I change, I lose them. Just ask that question before you make any changes to your cell phone bill. So number 11 is set up your new utilities before you even get started moving. Number 12, dealing with the moving company. As someone who has moved over eight times and at the last location that I lived in for nine years, I had acquired quite a bit of furniture as I had fully moved into my 2,600 square feet house and had enjoyed decorating it. While I have had wonderful help of family in the past, moving from one place to the other, this time I did decide to hire a moving company. Remember, the cost of the move can be written off in your upcoming taxes. This was one luxury I was so glad that I could invest in. This one took a lot of the stress off, tons of the stress off. Now this may sound daunting initially, but if you can make it happen, the fact that you can write it off is going to save you money. You won't be obviously able to get everything back that you spent, but you'll get a portion. And I think there's something to be said for the pricelessness of your stress and making sure all of your items arrive safely at their new home. Well, I will get to the details of working with moving company in the second stage. Prior to the move, you will want to scope out a few moving companies and schedule them to stop by to give you an estimate. This is free. At this time, when they stop by to give you an estimate, ask for recommendations of customers who they have worked with. Schedule these appointments as early as possible, especially during the summer months, as many families and people are relocating, obviously, just like me, and their schedules become quite full. Then you'll make your decision. I started working with my moving company a good month and a half before, and it was perfect. It was perfect. Number 13 is plan a moving sale. A move, as we all know, is a wonderful opportunity to expunge from your life items such as furniture, clothing, and anything else that you truly do not use anymore. Planning a moving sale also will give you an opportunity or a great way to provide time to be with your neighbors and acquaintances 
and have your last goodbyes and just kind of have that last little conversation. On today's show notes, I include a few images of the moving sale that I held just a few days before I moved. It was very successful and it ultimately allowed me to find new homes for some of my most beloved pieces and save me money in the long run as I didn't have to move some of these items, which cut down on the price of the moving costs. If you're interested in having a yard sale and don't know how to organize it or want to make sure you organize it in a way that's very successful, having done it three times in the last four years, I have a checklist for you and I provide a link to that blog post that I wrote a few years ago on today's show notes, the simplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 48. So number 13, plan a moving sale. And number 14 is to gather up your beauty info. What do I mean by this? If you get your hair colored or you get spray tanned or you get a certain color at your beauty salon and you don't know what it is, they just use it and you love it. Talk to your estheticians, talk to your hairstylists, ask them for all the information, the color number, the color combination, the brands of the companies, whatever it is, get this information before you leave. It takes a long time, as some of us know, to find those people that work best with our skin with our hair. And when we find them, it's like leaving a very good friend. Oftentimes they become very good friends because they know us so well and we talk to them about so much. Ask these questions before you leave. It will ease so much stress and anxiety over those little things that just help us look and feel our best. So get that beauty information, gather it up before you leave, number 14. And the last one in this first stage of moving, number 15, let your emotions out. Whether you have chosen to move or not, allow your emotions to be felt, whatever they are, whether it's crying, dancing, cheering, or bawling, do it. It's natural. In, in, in many ways, you are either grieving the loss of the life you are leaving behind or exuberantly celebrating your growth and new beginnings. Either way, feel it, move through it, and then strive forward. You will be all the better off for doing so. That wraps up the first of the three stages of our moving checklist. I'm going to take a quick one minute intermission and I will see you on the other side to begin the second stage, what to do during the move. I'll see you in a minute. Welcome back. So the second stage in moving, we're going to call the during stage for us this episode, can often be the cause for much of the stress and anxiety. But if you plan ahead, like we just talked about, you've already alleviated so much potential for frustration. And if you follow these few steps I'm going to talk about, I think you'll find that it's actually a great time to just kind of sit back and relax and kind of just be lost in your thoughts for a bit. So Here we go. Number one, with regards to the moving, I want to first begin by recommending wholeheartedly, because some of you have been asking, the moving company that I hired. Without hesitation, I absolutely recommend Mountain West Moving. You'll see my recommendation on Google for this company. It's out of based out of La Grande, Oregon, but they took me from Pendleton, as you know, to Bend. I was just amazed how seamless it was. They were absolutely professional, courteous, and everything arrived safe on time and actually under budget, which is always a very good thing. 
The main thing that people worry about here, well, I shouldn't say that. I think there are two. It's cost and the safety of your things, which is absolutely understandable. Now, let's talk about a few things with regards to moving. Number one, cost. There are many myths and horror stories about hiring a moving company, but in Oregon, and I'm not sure about other states, so look into your state, the cost of moving, of working with a moving company, is regulated by state law. If you are moving out of town, the cost is determined by distance and weight. If you are moving within the same town, the rate is actually clocked hourly. So I will provide a link on today's show notes for Oregon's Department of Transportation guidelines, but you want to look for your own state and see exactly what those regulations are. Always look for recommendations from people who have used a company successfully. That's why I'm giving you mine. Make sure that they come fully licensed and bonded and they should be able to provide you insurance as well because anything they move is insured. That takes us to point number two, insurance. You can purchase insurance on your move and there are many different tiers of levels you can you can get. Just remember though that everything they pack will be insured, but anything you pack will not. So I was thinking, oh yeah, I'll pack over the weekend. I'll get a bunch of things packed up and save myself some money. In the long run, it's almost better if they do it. It's insured. So the only thing I actually packed up were things I was so protective of and that was my clothing. I, I know that sounds crazy, but I wanted to make sure that they were properly taken care of. My clothing, my shoes, my accessories. I did that. Everything else they did. Number three is what to pack. Make sure before the packing begins that you walk through with the movers what should not be packed. There were a few things that I arrived in bend with. I'm like, whoa, that's supposed to stay with the house. So I have to mail those back. But there were that was just my poor communication. Just about everything I wanted to come with me or everything I wanted to stay did. It was only a few minor items. It's best if you have concerns about anything, like I just said with the clothing, that you pack it yourself. But to be honest with you, I could have let them pack it. Anything else, everything else was safely and securely moved. The fourth item with regards to moving is you want to make sure that you're packing like you're going to go on a vacation for about two or three days. So pack a travel tote. Before the movers get there, get one suitcase out and pack it just like you would if you're going on a weekend getaway. Most likely it'll take you about two to three nights. For me, it took two nights out of my physical bed. Although there was one night I was on my mattress, but it was on the floor and there was no headboard and all that fun stuff. So before they get there, pack up your suitcase as though you were going traveling with your toiletries, your beauty supplies, your PJs, your outfits, and your shoes. So you can be as comfortable as possible during this transition. And don't forget about your pups or your pets. Pack some food for them and all the different supplies you'll need for them. Because everything else, the, the, the movers are going to take anything that's movable. They're going to pack up unless you say otherwise. And the last part of moving, number five, if you pack anything or if you're doing all the packing, label everything very clearly so it becomes much easier when you get to your new destination. And always put the label on the sides of the boxes, not the top. List the contents and the room you wish it to go to. All right, that was a short little stage during the move. Let's get in to settling in. The fun part. This is the part you've been waiting for. Number one, this may sound frivolous to some, but once you experience it, you'll realize the importance of setting the tone for a lovely welcoming into your new home. So number one is plan ahead for a warm welcome. The little things make a tremendous difference, especially when you are arriving at your new town and home. And while it may be the last thing on your mind, take time before you arrive, perhaps even weeks ahead of time, and plan for a few welcome touches to occur on the first day of your arrival. For example, my aunt and uncle who live here in the Bend area, they actually hosted a lovely simple dinner the night before I moved in as I needed a place to sleep because my mattress was in the truck. Thinking ahead, my aunt provided me with all of the leftovers so that the next night I would have dinner at my new place and I would not have to worry about cooking. So whether you have someone to do this for you, or you just know of a great place with great takeout, make sure you plan ahead for that first night because most likely you're not going to be able to cook for yourself and you want to have a good meal, maybe even a glass of wine. Also, 
there were two highly anticipated book releases for the day of my arrival, July 14th in Bend. So a few weeks ahead of time, I decided to have them delivered to my new address. Sure enough, when I arrived, they were waiting on my new doorstep. And as burden... As burdensome as it may sound, I also traveled with a bouquet of flowers that were just too beautiful to leave behind. So they were placed on the footboard in, or the floorboard, I should say, of my car on the passenger side, and they made the trek with me. And I, I, I know it's something simple, but just putting fresh flowers in a house with a bunch of boxes that are coming in, just it just added life to the room. And lastly, while this particular event didn't occur on the day I arrived, it was something I had to look forward to. Once I knew I was moving to Bend, I learned that a band I enjoyed listening to, Pink Martini, would be playing at the local amphitheater. I decided to give myself a gift and I purchased tickets. At the time, I had no idea who I would be going with, but I knew I wanted to go and I thought "Mm, it might be a great way to see and experience Bend. So just this past Saturday, I attended the concert and it was indeed a lovely culmination to the moving that I had just experienced. And if you're wondering what two books I was talking about, you can go to the show notes and check those two out as well as see a few pics I took at the concert on Saturday. It was lovely. The weather was splendid. So number one is plan ahead for a warm welcome. Number two, set up your mail service. If you have a locked mailbox, you're going to want to stop by your local post office branch for the key. If you have to have a key made, which you may have to um, for whatever reason, but for the most part, you shouldn't. It will cost you 40 bucks. Um, but again, that's something you can write off in your taxes. If you simply have a traditional mailbox, you are golden. You don't have to pay for a key, obviously. And the only thing you'll probably have to do is leave a little card in your box. Your mailman will leave this or mail person will leave this in your box. And you'll just have to fill out the names of the people who will be receiving mail at that mailbox. And you're set. So number two, Set up your mail service. Number three, copy any and all keys of importance. From your front door to your work keys, make copies now. Of all places to be locked out, you don't want to be locked out in this new town that you've lived in. After all, you may not know your neighbors well. You know, may not know where to get keys made. Be preventative and make copies of the important keys. Number four, introduce yourself to your immediate neighbors. Casually and naturally, you definitely want to refrain from knocking on their doors. That's a little intrusive. But if you happen to see them outside or they're walking, introduce yourself briefly. It's crucial to make the first meeting with your neighbors a positive one, as it really does set the tone for future encounters. And it just makes you feel a little safer. And then probably it will give them a peace of mind just knowing who you are as well. So number four is introduce yourself to your immediate neighbors. Number five is find help for removing moving materials. At first, when I unpacked everything, got everything out of the boxes, I had a garage that was seriously stocked full of cardboard and wrapping paper. You couldn't move in my garage. I honestly could not believe how many boxes and paper I had. Thus, why everything made it safely. But still, I was like, what do I do with all this stuff? I mean, all I had was my car. I didn't have a pickup to take it to the recycling center. So Thankfully, my movers told me about what to do with it. And a moving company or moving companies in the bend here, and I'm assuming almost all moving companies do this, they will come to your house and pick up cardboard and wrapping paper that was used in a move for a fee. So get the estimate before they arrive, but they usually can come within the day and pick it up, which is a huge relief, saves you time. And again, you can write that off in your taxes. So number five, hire help to remove your moving materials. Number six, Keep all of your receipts of the moving process for your taxes. As I have been mentioning throughout today's episode, you want to keep all of the receipts for your move. From the mover's receipts to the mileage in your car, keep all of these filed away safely for tax season as you can write them off in your expenses for relocating. A few years ago, I made a list of tips and ways to stay organized for your taxes or prep for tax season, and I will provide a link to that on today's show notes in case you are getting ready for that. So that's number six. Keep all receipts of the moving process for taxes. All right. 
I have six more ways that you can settle in to your new home. I'm gonna take a quick 30 second intermission and I will see you on the other side. All right, welcome back. We are on the third and final, wrapping up that final third stage of settling in to our new home. And before I get into these final six, I want to really quickly apologize. You may have heard in the last part of this episode or in the first two thirds of this episode, a little bit of heavy breathing in the background. And bless his heart, Norman has been sitting next to me. He has in these last week and a half, it's been a bit of an adjustment for him. And of both the dogs, I thought maybe it would be Oscar, but it was actually Norman. And he is at my feet quite a bit. So he is here where I am taping the podcast today. And he is in deep sleep and absolute peace. So if you hear some heavy breathing in the background, it is my sweetheart, Mr. Norman. So here we go. Let's get into the final six ways to settle in to your new home. Number seven is about those items that maybe came along and shouldn't have. So number seven is remove or revisit these items for later. If you come across boxes of stuff or items that you realize won't work at your new home or you realize you really just don't need them. Keep them boxed up and revisit them in say a year or so to see if you truly need them. Or you might want to just take the bull by the horns and donate them immediately. Go for it. You will thank yourself later because you will have more space and less stuff to kind of be that extra little burden that you don't even know consciously is there but is. So number seven is to remove immediately or box up and revisit later those items that you realize you just don't need anymore. Number eight is stay in the know. So as soon as you arrive or a day or two prior, set up your local newspaper delivery as a way of getting to know your new community and discovering all of the social events and outings that you might want to explore. Number nine is begin setting up your home gradually. While it would be lovely to snap our fingers and have our homes magically be set up upon a big move, Take some time with this process as you truly get a feel for what would work best for your lifestyle. A few rooms that maybe should be set up immediately so you can feel at home would be your master bedroom, your kitchen, your bathrooms, and your living or family room. Other than that, don't stress yourself out to unbox every single thing the first day. Often as we begin to live in a space we forget about certain routines that don't work and we tend to, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We're, we're self-editing without realizing it. And when you realize this, you may realize, oh, I don't need these items or I don't need that extra paper or whatever it is that you use for that routine. This in turn affects how you'll set up your home and what you will need. The second stage of the rooms you'll need to set up would be your laundry room, your dining room, and your office. And the third and final stage, I would suggest your outdoor spaces, your hallways, your entry or foyer, and any extra rooms. And the final is the garage. Now, this is the goal I set for myself. I told myself, okay, you're not going to get everything done the first day. And I have tried to do that in the past. And I just exhaust myself and I end up making rash decisions at the end because I'm just so exhausted and I just want to get it done. So depending on your schedule, I'll tell you what my goal was, but depending upon your schedule and your ability to get unpacked, decide on either a week, if you have no job that you have to do, for example, for, for me, I was able to blog and write at my own leisure and I don't have a job until school starts, I gave myself a week 
to unpack every single box and set up every single room. Now you might wanna give yourself a month if you're actually moving and immediately starting your new job or have a family, whatever extra things you have to do. But do set yourself a goal. You don't want to be that person who a year later still has boxes and some rooms that aren't set up. That is not a home make. So set a goal. I was absolutely elated when my garage was empty of boxes and stuff and everything was set up in all my rooms because my garage was the last thing I was going to set up and I could pull my car in there and use that room, the garage, (laughs) as it was intended. I saved the garage for last as a way of punctuating the end of the moving process. And it really felt like there was the closure there, that closure that I needed to say, you are officially here. You are officially home. So set a goal for yourself and steadily make progress, maybe in your in your. Maybe in your planner set, I will set up office today or I will put the mirrors up in the hallway or the pictures up in the office, whatever it is. So number nine, begin setting up your home, but do so gradually. Number 10, I have a list of furniture and decor that will make a space feel like home. Now, one thing I noticed when I began setting up is that my home became a home and more quickly than I expected. And I started to think, well, why is that? Why is the, why does this feel so so much like a home? I mean, I just left my old place. But before I get into the furniture that I think was helpful, let me just give you four things that helped make this process easier. And I think it's a lot of the ways that we talk about here on Living Simple Luxuriously on the blog, on the, the podcast. Number one, I had set up routines that simplified my life, but also made me more productive and set me on the track for living the way I wanted to live, healthy, mindfully, and intelligently. And so my routines, I knew what breakfast worked for me. I knew what kind of dinners um, would give me energy, but not to feel unnecessarily full. So I knew when I went to the grocery store, for example, what food to get so that I wasn't wasting money, but I also knew that would be quick and easy to eat and leave me feeling good. So that was one thing, just routines, your routines that work for you. Number two was that I have a lot of neutrals. My furniture is very neutral. The big items, for example, the sofa, the bed, certain chairs, as I've shown pictures of my house. So they really could mesh with my new home. Now, I will tell you that I currently am renting because I am in escrow with my first house that I'm selling. And I want to take some time to get to know the neighborhoods in Bend. So I'm not going to be painting the walls here. I'm not going to be doing uber decorating here. And I'm just very thankful. And this is the case with most rentals that the walls are very neutral. So my neutral furniture is working very well with this home. It looks and it feels good. And I, part of that is I have furniture that works with that. Now, am I saying that you should go out and just buy neutral furniture so that you can move and and no, I mean, I believe me, I know what you're thinking in that regard, but that has helped. Now my accents have color in them. But that's also things you can store until you get into that house that you buy or that you can swap out momentarily. Things like that are easy to change, but those big items are not. So neutral basics with regards to furniture is helping. Number three, basic dishes. And what I mean by that is I have all white dishes. So they seem to really just go with whatever the kitchen is. That has helped. And anything that's uniform looks a little bit more regal, a little bit more purposeful. Now, again, this is my taste. This is something I've chosen for simplicity. But for me, aesthetically, I respond to that very viscerally. That has helped. And the fourth thing is that my bath linens as well are very neutral, all white, very simple, and they just work. They just give a clean, fresh aesthetic. So those four things have helped ease this transition. Now let's get to the furniture, as I was mentioning, that will help your space become a home more quickly. First thing is area rugs. Whether you have carpet or hardwoods, area rugs will define a space immediately. It's like laying down brand new carpet as soon as you get to a place. The next thing is to have luxurious bed linens. I've talked about this many times on the blog and on this podcast. You want to sleep well. You want to feel cozy at home and at bed. I mean, you're spending a third of your life in bed. Invest in luxurious bed linens. Those are things you can bring with you. A good pillow. Oh, such a lovely thing. Buy good food go to the great market, go somewhere where the food is just fresh. That will make it feel like home as well. Next thing, have trays, create vignettes, whether on coffee tables, side tables, on your bar cart, 
create these little vignettes that create a sense of home, a sense of you, a sense of a signature style. These are things that you can bring again with you from place to place. Next, you want to have mirrors throughout your house. Obviously, you want them to work with your space, work with your style, but invest in mirrors. I, on my Instagram feed just last week, found an, a circular mirror I just fell in love with, and I immediately gobbled it up because I knew I could use it in any home that I ever live in because it's completely my style, and I'm so glad I did. Next, make sure you create a space for your keys and your coat. Have a bowl on the console table when you walk in. Hooks for your leashes and coats, umbrellas, purses, handbags right there. That will help clear the clutter. Also make sure you know exactly where those important items are and create an organized space. Next is to add flowers. Fresh, simple flowers. Just like I said, one of, the, one of the items I brought with me on the first day to create a warm welcome was a bouquet of roses. Oh, it just is something simple, inexpensive, and adds so much. The last three, here we go. Table lamps, because they really create a softer lighting that is more warm and inviting. Add candles and scents to your living room, bathroom, or bedroom. And then with regards to your bathroom decor, make sure you have curtains for your shower, towels and floor mats that are soft. The texture is welcoming and clean. These little things are things that you can immediately do to your new space that will make it feel more at home without even bringing out one can of paint. And again, this list will be on the show notes so you can look at those and print those out. Also, if you're ready to dive in with the decorating, I have a whole list of decor posts on the archives page of decor. And I'll provide a link to that archives page where you can get more specific home decorating tips and ideas as you go about creating your very own sanctuary. So number 10, simple ways to create a space that is immediately something that feels like a home. Number 12 is to scope out and establish regular and necessary haunts. From your grocer to your coffee shop, begin to explore and then eventually settle in to the shops and destinations that you will be visiting regularly. As you begin to do this, you will begin to feel more and more as though your new hometown truly is home. I have a list of places that you may want to scope out, potentially have as haunts. Your grocery store. Specialty grocery stores in those areas of wine, cheese, meat, bread, or any other specialty food that you enjoy eating. Find that coffee or tea shop. Find your spa for your regular beauty appointments of waxing, facials, massage, nails, etc. Find your salon. How to do that? Well, if you know of any ladies or people that have hairstyles that you absolutely love, ask them. Get recommendations from them. That is the best compliment. Next is to find dog groomers and a dog supply or a pet supply store. Find your gym or a studio for your yoga or Pilates. Find your most enjoyable walking, running, or biking trails. Find those dog parks as well. And you want to find your restaurants that have your favorite type of food. Also in the summer and spring times, find those farmer's markets. Bookstores, you've got to find those. And last but not least, you know you're going to have to know where they're at. they are. <laughs> find those takeout restaurants that offer your favorite takeout food. Thai, Indian, Mexican, American American restaurants with those the best hamburgers and milkshakes for those comfort foods that we need from time to time. Now, if you live in Bend, and maybe this is available in your area as well, there are tons of restaurants here in Bend that don't directly have home delivery, but there is a company that actually works in tandem with them called bendtakeout.com. And I actually used this on my second night here and I could not believe the service. So I actually called up a place for Thai food because I was craving Thai food. I was hungry and my kitchen wasn't entirely set up yet. It was getting close. And they said, well, we don't home deliver, but call bendtakeout.com, give them your order and they will get it to you. I'm like, really? I'm not kidding you. In 20 minutes, I had my food at my door. And granted, I live close to the heart of town, but still 20 minutes, that's pretty good communication between this company and the actual restaurant. So bendtakeout.com for many restaurants in Bend that you may want to have delivered to your home. So number 11, that's the fun one. Start the exploration of your town and finding your favorite haunts. Last but not least is to begin establishing a social circle. The beautiful opportunity of moving is a fresh start when it comes to meeting people. And while our workplace 
places often provide a social network that's already built in. It is nice and healthy as well to establish relationships outside of our professional field. The key is to not be too overeager, have patience, and to be sincere about who we truly are. So be authentic. And lastly, to always remain curious. I have a handful of ways to help you connect with others. This first one is great, especially if you live, well, it's available to all different sizes of towns, but Bend, I've been very impressed, has tons of these things at meetup.com. These are organic places where people set up groups and they have certain interests and you can join as many as you want. And they have different meetups and times and you don't have to go, but you can go. It's just fantastic. Could be for food lovers, for dog walkers, for kayakers, for paddleboarders, for book lovers, for foodie. I mean, it really the sky's the limit. And you can set up your own. If you have a small town, you're like, hey, I need to find the Francophiles in my town. Set up a meetup.com. Everything's online. You can meet in a public place. It's fantastic. I'm actually considering setting up a French meetup here in a while because there is no Alliance des Français here. And I think there should be. So if you're with me, let me know. But um, anyway, check out meetup.com. I have, and I'm really anxious to check out some new places and meet some new people. The next thing is to go ahead and attend events alone. I mean, don't be afraid to do this. This is how you're going to get out there and meet people that have similar interests. So for example, Pink Martini, when I went this last Saturday, I went by myself and I actually ended up meeting a great person who was sitting next to me and obviously a fan of Pink Martini. They themselves, much like me, were not big concert goers, but they love Pink Martini. And so they came and we ended up having great conversations and I learned so much about Bend and we exchanged phone numbers and we're meeting for coffee and I absolutely cannot wait. It was so much fun and you just never know who you will meet. So open yourself up and be willing to go out and enjoy things alone. The next is to become a regular. Once you've found your favorite places, as I mentioned, and obviously those are going to change with time, but start going there regularly. Become a regular face. Introduce yourself casually and eventually to the workers. And if you see other regulars there, if a conversation is natural to strike up, do so. But this is a fun way to really just say, hey, I really live here. I'm not a tourist. And uh, you'll meet people of similar interest and similar taste. Another way is to visit parks and different walking trails regularly. And often you'll see the same people. I've gone to a few dog parks and met a handful of people because we have obviously a love for dogs. And we've had great little conversations of just, hey, I'm new too here. It's amazing how many people are new here in Bend. It's, it slays me. But it's a great way, again, to meet people with similar interests. And the last one, if you're into politics or just want to get to know the city, is to go to city council meetings. Again, this is going to show a certain interest level, a certain passion and curiosity, and like minds will be there. So, Or maybe not like minds, and you can have some fantastic conversations. But that's another way to start meeting people in your new town. So number 12 is to begin establishing a social circle. With anything in life, if you have a plan, you will be more successful. Maybe a few things will be changed or unexpected from your plan. But for certain, as one of my former colleagues reminds their students, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Moving is an extraordinary journey you will be undertaking, but the beauty is that it is an enormous opportunity. See the opportunity to truly spread your wings, step into your new self and home, and make the most of something that doesn't occur that often. I will admit, I still cannot look at images of my former house as I, I know I'll be gimballing. However, I know that this eventually will subside and I will be able to look at it. It will become easier. And I can say with certainty, the moment I arrived in Bend, the moment I drove into the Bend outskirts, that first evening here as a resident, the process of relocating was seen as an extraordinary occasion, and I did not want to fritter it away. Neither should you. I feel quite fortunate to have had the positive experience that I have had during my relocation here, but I know for certain this is not an anomaly. We can all have a similar experience if we prepare and approach it with a positive yet informed state of mind. I wish you well as you move forward with your life. It will be lovely and it will be a change for the better. Let me leave you with a quote to ponder from Suzanne Colasanti. Because if you take a risk, you just might find what you're looking for. All right, for today's show notes on today's episode, the moving checklist, go to the blog, the simply luxurious life.com backslash podcast 48. 
I do hope you've enjoyed it. And now I have a petite pleasure that will be simple for you in the kitchen and satiate those taste buds like no other. I'll see you in just a moment. Welcome back for this week's Petit Plaisir. And it is something you can go to your local farmer's market and pick up most of the ingredients for. It is a berry galette. Now, it was inspired by a most recent cover of Bon Appetit. I saw the image and, of course, my taste buds were craving it. They had a blueberry galette on the cover. And so I found the recipe and I made it. And it was amazing. And I was like, what is so different about this? Well, it is the crust. The crust uses toasted pecans. So you use a half a cup of toasted pecans. You toast them at 375 for 10 to 15 minutes, only tossing them once. And then you let them cool for about 5, 10 minutes. Drop them in the food processor. Chop them up. And then make your dough like usual. And again, I'll have all the ingredients and the directions and the recipe on today's show notes, podcast 48. This adds a nutty, lovely flavor. I cannot quite describe it. I am a lover of crust. I have a ton of crust recipes on the blog that are lovely, buttery, soft, and flaky. This one's all those things and something more. So like I said earlier on the top of today's episode, I made this twice. I made this two weeks ago and I made this just this past weekend. And the second time I made it, I made it with mixed berries. So some raspberries and blueberries, but you could make it with strawberry and rhubarb. You could make it with apple. You can make with any fruit you want. It doesn't have to be a berry tart or galette, I should say. And the reason it's called a galette is it's much more rustic. You don't put it in an actual pan. It's free form. And so once you roll out the chilled dough, by the way, you can make the dough a day or two days ahead of time. You roll out the chilled dough. You place the fruit in the middle after you've mixed it up. And the fruit mixture is so simple. Leave about two inches on the side all the way around. Then fold it up with your hands. Dust the dough with heavy whipping cream, as you'll see in one of my pictures on today's show notes. And then put it in the oven for about 40 to 45 minutes at 375 degrees. And it is absolutely amazing. Definitely put some ice cream on the top because that's just a little lovely compliment. And you can thank me later. (laughs) No, but seriously, it's delicious. It's absolutely delicious and so simple. You will just be like, this doesn't take any time. And your guests, if they are not pie lovers, they're going to taste this crust and they're going to be like, hmm, maybe I will become one. So today's recipe is on the show notes, the simplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 48 for the berry galette at any berry or fruit that you would like. And you'll see my picture, the beginning and the end of the making of this galette to see how simple it really is. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each Monday's podcast, where I'll recommend a book, a film, or a recipe that offers insight into how to live simply luxuriously. Anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, stop by the blog, the Simply Luxurious Life. Or pick up the book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, A Modern Woman's Guide. Until next Monday, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour.